I go to the gym every day and I think I'm not growing my muscles very well because I'm basically doing the same thing. Yeah. I'm like, I know that I should be doing something differently here. Yeah, what, we, we can do better than that. What are the fundamental things I need to be thinking about? I'm going to go to the gym tomorrow morning now, but what do, yeah. I, what do I need to be thinking about? What you've kind of described is playing a game of variation against specificity. Okay, like anything, pros and cons here, it's not much better. If you were to go hyper-specific, you did the exact same workout every single time. You would drive a lot of adaptation because you're seeing exactly what you're going after. At the same time, though, you've increased our chance of overuse injury problems because we're, we're putting all of our load and stress in the same movement patterns, the same joints, et cetera. If you go the other direction, which is like, I literally just make up my workouts every single time, right? Chance of overuse of a specific movement pattern goes down, but progress also goes down because there's not enough stimulus in the same pattern. So we need consistency. We need to drive a groove and get better at something, but we don't want to be there. So how do we play the game a little bit? Well, we want to have what's called variation. We want to have for you some sort of progressive overload. How do we achieve that? We can go up in load or weight, okay? We can go up in reps per set. We can go up in sets. We can go up in number of exercises. We can go up in what's called frequency. So how many days per week? We could do a combination. We could reduce your rest intervals, how much time you're resting between reps. Any combinations, right? But we have to have some strategy. We can't do it all. Mm -hmm. And what we want to think about is 10% which is no more than a 10% increase week to week. Okay, that'll be enough where we can progressively overload you, but also not really uh, make our injury risk too high. So we would want a, a fairly consistent plan for maybe six to eight weeks or so that we can watch and monitor and go, okay, great. What I would recommend you doing is having, say, 50 workouts all planned out. And you're going to get to the end of 50 whenever you get to the end of 50. We're not doing like you work out legs Monday, you do upper body Wednesday. No, no, here's your workout. And this is the order you're going to do them in. And here's the 50 you're going to complete. And we're going to write a new program when you're done with 50. But if you can get extra workout one done today, and tomorrow you can get workout number two done, great. And then it's three days before you get to number three, fine. Number four. So instead of thinking about this on like a seven day mm -hmm. microcycle is what we called it. No, no, no. We just have this much work to get done. Ideally, we want to get this 50 done in the next 100 days. Okay, great, whatever. You're going to go three or four days in a row because you're like, hey, actually, I got a trip going on. I'm not going to be able to train those two days, so I'm going to train four days in a row. Well, it's not ideal, but it's better than skipping three days. Mm. Okay, great. Then you're going to come back and go, hey, I'm actually home for 10 days. I got to stretch. I'm going to go three days a day off. Oh, okay, great. Like, but that's what we would do as a system somewhere like that. Well, we, you know what the end goal is, but that allows us to then construct those 50 days with intentional overload. One of the questions I have is, can I achieve it all at once. And being more specific, I want to gain muscle mass and I want to stay super lean yep. <laughs> at the same time. And there's a school of thought that says you've got to like load up and then you've got to cut. But I don't want to do that. I just want to gain muscle mass, but stay lean. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Yes. Oh, good. Great. Yeah. A couple things to think about here. It depends on your baseline fitness and your how lean you are to start. Okay, now you're pretty lean as it is already, and I assume you're reasonably fit. I mean, clearly you work out and stuff like, okay, great. It's going to be a little harder for you, right? If you're really, really unfit and you're really overweight, it's much easier to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time, right? So it's going to be challenging for you, especially you've got a number of uh, three years of training. Uh, that's still kind of like early in your training age, right? That's a pretty young training age. We got some newbie gains that we'll still be able to take advantage of, especially you don't have like a specific plan and tension with your training and so you're kind of just, you know, working out. All right, great. We would be able to have pretty good success with that. Physiologically, it's possible. It's never going to be 100% though. There's no way I can put, especially without exogenous testosterone, there's just no way I can put 15 pounds of muscle on you and zero fat. Like that's just not going to happen. Could we put on seven or eight pounds of muscle and one pound of fat? Oh yeah, we could do that. Like that would not be a crazy thing. You would see that pretty consistently in the research and certainly thousands of coaches and practitioners are like, oh yeah, like I've seen that countless times. And so it's it's kind of like, what are the reasonable expectations there? Um, so what I would do is for you is recommend saying, you don't have to go like 40 pounds and like, you know, but can, how much do you really want to be at? What's that number, right? We would 
figure that out. Maybe run analysis on you, see where you're actually at. All right, great. And then we set reasonable expectations. So you want to end up being, you know, you want to put on five kilos total. Okay, tremendous. You willing to accept, you know, five kilos, uh, four and a half kilos of muscle and uh, maybe one of fat. Oh, okay, great. We get reasonable expectations. And then what you would want to do there is train consistently. You would want to be in a close to caloric, slight surplus as possible. We have to add calories to gain mass, right? But how we're going to do that is 10% surplus, something like that. So if your normal maintenance with all your exercise is 3,000 calories, I don't need you to go to 6,000 calories. That's a recipe to put on some muscle, but a lot of fat too. Now, we don't know the exact number here. There's a lot of studies going on. Actually, friends of mine, Eric Helms in New Zealand has done a handful of studies like this recently, trying to figure out what is that number? 5%. 10%, 20%. Where is the number in terms of caloric excess that you want to be on to put the most amount of lean muscle mass and the least amount of fat on? Because it's not going to be zero, right? 10 or so percent, which for you would be 10% of 3,000 would be 300 extra calories. Maybe 15%. Maybe going to 500 extra calories. We're not going to 5,000 calories. Right? We're not making these crazy jumps mm -hmm. in your situation there. We'd make sure protein is really, really high. Uh, at least two grams per kilogram right? Something like that, maybe even higher, making sure we have enough extra on there, but we're hedging on if we're going to miss the mark, I'd rather you miss by 15% too high than 2% too low. There's just no advantage of being down there. And then we'll regulate caloric intake in terms of your calories and fat. We would play with those ratios. If you want to do a little more fat, a little less carbs, we could do that. If you want to do the episode, we, we could play with that stuff, but we, those would be the standards we'd set. Does it matter what time I eat? in terms of exercise? Because I've always heard that you should eat sort of immediately after you do a workout. Doesn't matter. In terms of protein timing, if you're just looking at muscle growth, none of the other human factors, which there are many, then timing of protein is pretty irrelevant. You're fine. Timing of carbohydrates does start to matter though, specifically for recovery. Now that typically happens in athletes that train multiple times a day. That said, with both of them, you have options. Uh, again, look at the research on intermittent fasting. You don't see, especially if you look at the, the classic kind of like 16-8, which is you, you, know, you have a condensed eating window of just six hours a day and the other 18 you're fasting. Um, that is not any more advantageous for fat loss than non-fasting. There doesn't seem to be any difference at all when you account for calories and protein. So if you want to eat six meals a day, great. You want to eat one meal a day, won't matter for fat loss. So that still though tells us timing of protein, it's just not super important for someone like you for muscle mass gains. The only practical challenge is this. If we need you at that two grams of protein per kilo, or maybe higher, can you get enough food in during your timing of eating? Sometimes, yeah. Um, you know, in our study, we had plenty of participants that had no issue eating all their food and calories in a caloric surplus in a six hour window. They had no problem. Others really struggled. And so now we're not talking science or physiology, we're talking practical application. You and your own personal life, uh, my stomach is so full or timing of work or whatever. But if that's not the case, then I'd be like, great, we're gonna have no problem. So I wouldn't be super concerned with the timing of either of your, or, or any of your macronutrients um, outside of personal preference, real world situations, things like that. If I'm just a normal guy, which I very much am, and I'm maybe a busy business person, or I just have a you know a job as a manager or something, and I'm thinking about the types of training that are going to help me perform at my best cognitively in my work, but then just be healthy over time in my life, what is the like blend of training types and styles and durations that are optimal for me to just be a great average Joe? Mm -hmm. You need a handful of physiological skills to age super well. Okay. So if you want to live and live as well as possible for a long time, and it comes down to a couple of things, you need to move well. What's that mean? Different definitions, but you need to move in a way that is not getting hurt, causing pain. Great. That comes down to movement skill. There's some flexibility in there. There's some mobility. And there's also just like, do you know how to stand up? Do you know how to walk? Right? So we need to move well. So something where you're addressing I don't need you to be the most talented sprinter in the world, but we just can't have glaring holes. Can have huge problems in mobility, flexibility, posture, ranges of motion, because we have to stay out of pain. So number one, biggest key 
to successful aging when it comes to exercise is not missing training. We can't miss training for big chunks in time, months and years, because we're hurt. We have to stay active. Uh, okay. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.